Thank you very much, Janjira, for reading God's Word. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Panif, who is our worship leader, brought Janjira many, many years ago to come to this church because Janjira uh, is his uh, niece, all right? And, uh, and you can see that how the Lord uses our relatives, our friends, to bring more people to Christ. And I encourage you to bring a friend to come along and to hear God's word with us. Before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Our loving, gracious Father, we thank you again for your word. Your word is truth. Your word releases us to speak the truth in love to a world that does not know that truth. And thank you that the ultimate truth, when the word became flesh, continues to speak to us through his life, through his disciples and his disciples' disciples. And so as recipients of that truth, we now ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us, guide us, lead us, rebuke us and correct us and train us unto all righteousness. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Have you ever tried this thing called trust fall? Have you done this? You know, usually, I, I, I won't do it here because there's no one to hold me up, right? But usually you, you are on, on top of a high place. That there's a group of people below you and you're supposed to fold your, your hands and cross your leg and then you're supposed to drop backwards and the people below you will basically cushion your fall and carry, carry you safely down to the ground. The very first time I did this was when I was in primary six. I still remember very clearly um, that it was in St. John's Island. There were a lot of fire ants there as well. I got bitten quite badly uh, there. But I remembered that I, I had to do this and then drop and my friends, all P6 kids, were supposed to catch me. And to add things to, to the, the whole idea of trusting your friends, um, the teacher and the trainer got a girl, in fact, the girl whom I had a crush on, to, to be underneath those hands that are supposed to catch my fall. And of course, if they do not catch my fall properly, guess what? I'll land on that poor girl, right? And if I were to struggle and open my hands up, guess what? I will hit the faces of my friends and they will be frightened or be hurt and release their grip. And guess what? I will also fall through and hurt the girl that I had a crush on. Literally crush on. You didn't catch the pun. It's okay. <laughs> All right. So, so what happened was I, I noticed something. There, there are some of us who are okay. For me, I, I dropped and it was fine. But there are always a few, just a few, who always fling their arms open and whack their friends' faces or head and things like that, and it became more dangerous. And that exercise taught me something very important. That exercise taught me that sometimes, sometimes, when we are failing and when we are falling, we, we find it hard to trust that God will be there to hold us, to cushion our fall. We find it hard that this is a sovereign God who's absolutely in control and we know it cognitively right we know it we believe in it we preach about it we talk about it but when bad things happen to us when there's pressures in life when we're struggling and i don't know what you're struggling right now but i certainly struggled quite a fair bit while coming up here as i was limping here because my as you know my my knee right knee especially is busted and um and it's been a couple of months that i've had this injury and I find it hard to, you know, trust that uh, God can use the physiotherapist to take good care of me. And my question to you is this, how can we stop struggling, you know, when things, bad things happen to us and start trusting God? How can we do so? And today we want to turn our attention to the life of Joseph in the narrative between Genesis 37 to 50. But when I entitled this series as uh, Life of Joseph from Slave to Savior, 
Actually, this entire narrative talks also about his father Jacob. And today, in fact, from chapter 46 all the way to 49, these four chapters, you realize that the attention, the spotlight is now on Jacob, who's now called Israel. Israel. And today we want to learn from Jacob and also Joseph and see how God continues to fulfill his divine plan, which he has promised Jacob's grandfather Abraham all the way back to Genesis 12 to not only just through his seed bless the nations, that means you and I, but also to sustain and grow this group of sojourners into a nation and a nation to be considered as the apple of God's eye. And so as we turn our attention now to this particular chapter, chapter 46 and 47, it's a very long chapter, which is why earlier I asked you all to read it before we start our service. I want us to find out three things, three things to do in order to prevent us from struggling and help us to start trusting God. The very first thing I want us to know is that we can trust His promises. And that's found in verses 1 to 7. Let me read for you verses 1 to 4. It says here, So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Bathsheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am the God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph, Joseph's hands shall close your eyes. Now, you must understand about this love-hate relationship between Egypt and Israel. When I say Israel, I mean the people of Israel. If you recall this place, Egypt, you realize that throughout, up until now, at least up until chapter 46 of Genesis, Egypt has always been the go-to place whenever there's a famine in the land. And it seemed like over the last 70 over years, there's always been famine in the land, occasional famine in the land. Not as serious as what is happening right now in the lives of uh, the brothers of Joseph and Jacob. But if you even remember in Genesis chapter 12, what happened? Immediately after the promise to bless the nations and all that, what did Abraham, grandpa, did? He went down to Egypt and he lied to then the Pharaoh, Pharaoh and he said that Sarai, who wasn't named, renamed Sarah yet, but Sarai, was his sister. And Pharaoh obviously was attracted to Sarai and wanted to take her as his wife. And of course, you know the rest of the story in Genesis 12 verses 10 to 20. And if you can also recall, God specifically warned dad, Isaac, Jacob's father, not to go down to Egypt, even though there was a famine in Genesis 26, verse 2. Now, perhaps, just perhaps, Grandpa Abraham has, you know, maybe when, I, uh, when Jacob was a young boy, did tell you, no, God told me this. In, in Genesis 15, verse 13. Maybe Grandpa did tell Jacob about this. And he, he said to Jacob, probably at the time, the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now, if you, now, if you are Jacob, if you remember all the stories of Grandpa and Daddy, and now you are coming to Bathsheba, you have to really do what? You have to pause and rethink, right? Should I, should I not? Should I, should I not? After all, he is doing a great risk. 
not just risking you no know, his property his children and not even his own life and by then he had a lot of stuff now if you know what where bashiba is it is uh, let me show you a map you know it's at the southernmost tip of that land the promised land that's flowing with milk and honey and there's a saying from dan to bashiba whenever you see that that refers to the boundaries of israel now for those of you who are going to israel with me and brother wimping in november you will know that we are we are going actually up to the north almost dan area and then down south to bashiba and that's the two little dots red dots here as you see in the screen that is where dan and bashiba is and of course this refers to the end to end uh, of the promised land and just at the threshold of entering into egypt if you are jacob how would you feel you'll be very uncomfortable right you you in fact you will be very uncertain after all that i just left shechem a very nice piece of land grazing my cattle and all that and you are very unsure whether this is going to be the last time i'm going to see this beautiful place where i had all my memories and you will be struggling you'll be uncertain and all he had with him he's totally invested into this journey his entire family as we read in verse 1 of chapter 46 it was a huge risk for him and what would you do what would you do if you are jacob jacob did what he always did he wrestled he wrestled within himself and of course he built an altar and let me tell you why i say that because jacob has always been wrestling all his life it's a pity he didn't join the world wrestling federation wwf you know he wrestled and clung on if you remember in his mother's womb he clung on to esau's feet and went out together with the brother he he struggled and he wrestled even the birth rights away from esau he wrestled with god in genesis 32 if you remember that and then of course god touched his hip and he had to limp for the rest of his life and there and then he built uh, an altar in shechem and call it el elohe israel which means the mighty god is the god of israel his name <laughs> his own name and now he's wrestling within himself he's having internal turmoil it was a huge risk and he had to do this and he didn't want to and so what did he do naturally he offered sacrifices to god i wonder if you're uncomfortable when you're struggling when you are uncertain unsure about things what will you do you know we all struggle like jacob right i hope uh none of us will struggle as much as him but most of us will tend to revert back to our default nature and what is jacob's default nature he whines complains struggles remember chapter 40, 43 when i preached to you the moment he found out about what happened to uh to the the brothers when he came back the first time what did he do he complained right and now they wanted benjamin to go as well what did what did he do he said to his sons right he said that he, verse verse 6 of 43 he said this let me read for you israel said why did you treat me so badly as to tell me the man that you had another brother ie that is benjamin so when we are at our wit's end the end of our rope we don't tie a knot and hang in there what do we do we whine and we complain we blame we say things that it's not my fault it's your fault and this is exactly what jacob did and i can believe even the scripture doesn't tell us here in verse uh, chapter 46 but i can probably see that jacob now is struggling tremendously he's wrestling internally within himself so then how can he stop struggling and start trusting god how can we stop struggling and start trusting god and this is where we turn our attention to what was promised to him god took the initiative god 
God knew, God knew what kind of a deceiver, grabber, you know, uh, that Jacob was and intentionally even called him twice. If you remember that the verse itself, he says here, Jacob, Jacob, reminding him of who he is, right? Jacob, Jacob, the one who grabs. And what did God promise to this person who is almost slipping into the default mode, almost wanting to turn around and go back up with his tail beneath, under, between his legs, and then going back up to Shechem again. He promised him three things. God assured Jacob that I will go with you. No? In fact, he, he said, before he said that, he actually said, I will make you a great nation reminding him of what he promised him earlier, reminding him of what he promised to his dad and his, to his grandfather in verse 3. And not only just that, God also said that I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again. And then, the best part is, even if you die, Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Now, if you put yourself in the shoes of Jacob, so far, you have no evidence of the fact that Joseph is alive, right? You have no evidence. In fact, you have the only evidence that he's dead, that rope that you gave to him 20 over years ago, and his brothers brought back and said that he was killed. And now his brothers say that he's alive. And now his brother is saying that he's back in Egypt, the second most powerful man in Egypt and in that ancient Near East. And now all you can hear is these people, and don't forget you are a deceiver, a liar, a cheat. Yeah? So you think that everyone else is like you. <laughs> and what would you do? You will have second doubts, right? You'll be thinking, hmm, maybe I should... You know, go back up again. Maybe my sons are trying to deceive me. Maybe trying to murder me, get my... Oh, oh, the land. I'm not sure. And when God spoke to him, he said that, who? Joseph is still alive and he will be the one closing your eyes when you die. That is the assurance that Jacob needed. And did all these promises came to pass? You may be wondering, right, did all these promises came to pass? Obviously, it did. When, when Jacob came to Egypt, there were only 70 people. You know, scripture tells us, right, verse 27 says, All the persons of the house of Jacob came into Egypt were 70. Verse 27b of this chapter. But when they finally left, if you were to take the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 1 and chapter 26, you realize that there were just the men alone over 600,000, excluding the, the wives, the women, the children and all that. Realistically speaking, when they exited out of Egypt 400 years later, under the leadership of Moses, there were at least 2 million people there. So did it come to pass? Obviously it did. But not immediately, not in the time frame that Jacob wanted, but certainly it will come to pass. And second, God himself promised to go down with him to Egypt. And did God do that? He did. And when Jacob, we see later on, we'll see this later on, did he bring him back up to Canaan? We read that actually in chapter 50. I'm going ahead of myself. We're at the tail end of this series. Two sermons later, you see how God fulfilled that through Joseph who closed his eyes and even embalmed him. And so we, we see that God's promises always come to pass. And God always keeps his promises. What he says always happens. So that when we know that, we can stop struggling and start trusting in God. When we are failing, when we are falling, we need to trust and believe that this God keeps His promises. So how should we stop struggling? Trust 
in His promises. By the way, do you know that there are over 7,000 promises that God made directly to men? Specifically, 7,487. Someone actually did count that, excluding other promises between men and men and other things, men to God as well. Just on that number alone in scriptures. But let me share with you five promises just to encourage us that God, in the midst of our struggles, is with us. The very first thing, God hears us. In fact, Psalm 34, verse 18, one of my favorite verses, says this, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. When you are crushed, when you're sad, when you have lost someone dear to you, when you're struggling, God says that He's near us. The holy God near us, the sinful man. He reminds and tells us that our work is not in vain. In fact, Paul tells the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, saying that knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And then, when we are struggling, what is God doing to us? He tells us that struggles built our character. Romans 5, verses 3 and 4 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produce, produces character, and character produces hope. Are you struggling? When we are struggling, know that God is building your character. And God even reminds us that His grace is sufficient. We don't need to depend on our own strength. His grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, and my pow power is made perfect in weakness. And then finally, Jesus Himself promised us to give us rest. Come to me, all who, are labor, who, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, these are the promises of God and God's Son. I wonder when we are struggling, do we trust in God's promises? Do we even know of those promises? When we are falling and failing, how can we believe in God? Trust in His promises. But what else? What else can we do to stop struggling and start trusting in God? And this is when we want to move to the next portion of Scripture, which is found a very long uh, portion, verses 8 to 27. Let me read for you verses 8 to 12. And it says here, now, these are the names of the descendants of Israel who came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, thank you, Reuben, uh, Reuben Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Kami, and the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, and Jachin. So, Zohar and Shaul, and the sons, the sons of a Canaanite woman. Can you see that I'm struggling reading those names? The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Perez were Hezron and Halmu. Now look, I'm not going to read everything, all right? Thankfully. But I want you to drop your attention down to verses 26 and 27 and it says here, all the persons belonging to Jacob, verse 26, all the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the sons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. Now, genealogies are really very burdensome and boring, right? 
If you remember, uh, Brother Wenping actually said that genealogies are very, very important. Now, every year, uh, you know, uh, companies like uh, property companies like ERA or even like insurance companies like AIA, Prudential and all that, way back in the 90s and 2000s, if you remember, they put in full ads in Straits Times and all the major newspapers. And how many of you actually look at all those pictures? Yeah, Can I have sure? No, no one. In fact, you use the newspaper and wrap your, your maybe... <laughs> Yo, vegetable and all that. And, and so, things is similar. No? When we read genealogies, it's like looking at those pictures. So what? Who cares? Nobody cares, right? Because it's boring. It's burdensome. We cannot trace all these people unless, unless what? You are in one of those pictures. So, like maybe you're an insurance agent, you're a property agent. You say, where, where, where's my picture? Oh, there I am, in that little, little thing. corner. Unless, of course, you're like the top agent in a company, then your picture is a little bit bigger. But then guess what? That is because you are invested into it, right? Your, your picture comes out of it, or you feel good about yourself. Or for that matter, your, your siblings or your family, your mommy, you know, you, oh, my a boy you know, picture inside this Straits Times. You are only interested if you are invested in it, right? But genealogies are so important in the Bible. Why? Why is that so? Genealogies are important for two main reasons. The first, it helps us to trace God's ultimate plan of salvation and in fact it points towards jesus if you look at this genealogy and i actually surfaced verse 12 for you the sons of judah and if you were to compare that to say for example in the gospel of matthew also the first book in the new testament like genesis the first book in the old testament you realize that jesus came from this lineage of Judah. And now, is that important to all of us here? Yes, of course. So it helps us to trace God's ultimate plan of salvation. And the second reason why genealogy is important, if you were to read all these names, none of us, unless you're trying to name your son or your grandson, you know, trying to, you're, you're lost with ideas. So you look at all this genealogy and say, maybe I'll just pick one name. But be careful what name you pick, all right? Some of them died very young. Some of them will be really terrible. <laughs> but guess what? These people, however insignificant or small they are, tells us that God actually cares for them, you know. God actually writes them down in his book of all books and for generations and for entire history these names are told to many people and see how many insignificant people are there in this genealogy alone just see none of us can remember them but god remembers them god cares for them now the key the key to stopping our struggles in life is to trace God's ultimate plan for salvation. Trace His plan. That's what we need to do. That's what we are called to do. When we are struggling in life, we need to trace His plan. We need to see the big picture of what He's trying to do. Our names are certainly not written there. Maybe you're named after one of them. I'm not sure. So far as I know, none of, them, none of us here are named after them. But, but, guess what? Our names are written in the book of life. And God, in fact, tells us through Isaiah. If you read Isaiah 49, I love Isaiah 49, especially verse 16. It says here what? God has engraved God has engraved us in the palm of His hands. Now, if we were to look at the immediate context of Isaiah 49, verses 14 and 15, guess what? Zion, which is Israel, Judah, was struggling at that time to see God, to trust God. And so, verse 14 of Isaiah 49 says what? 
The Lord has forsaken me. Zion said this. The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. And then came the voice of God in verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on a son of a womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. And then comes verse 16 that he promised to engrave us, engrave Zion on the palm of his hands. Amazingly, despite Zion's unfaithfulness, despite Zion's sins, God promised never to leave them nor forsake them. Just as God has promised through Jesus Christ to never leave us nor forsake us. The very last few words of Jesus on this earth was, you know, as He commissions us, He says, so, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. God gives Israel this image of engraving at the palm of His hands. And we are reminded this, that God, just like a mother who tattoos her names into her heart, if you are a parent, you know this. No matter how wayward your children are, you will always love them. And because of that, God will never forget us. Which is why we need to remember this. We need to trace what God is doing in our lives. Sometimes we forget, and that's why we struggle. And in our struggles, we begin to doubt God. But God tells us to trust in His promises. God tells us to trace our lives because of His plans for us. Now, the thing is this. How can we, therefore, trace God's plans, right? We, we need to ask ourselves this question. How can we trace God's plans? Let me give you a few suggestions here, all right? A few suggestions here for us to be able to sustain ourselves and protect ourselves in our times of struggles. The very first thing is you need to study. You need to study the promises. I give, I've given you five. Go and find out the rest of 740, 7,487 <laughs> other promises. Please go ahead and find them, all right? Read cover to cover. But not only just the promises, but also the prophecies of God. Why? And in the next two, two years or so, we'll be focusing a, quite a fair bit on the prophecies of God in our pulpit uh, itself. Because those prophecies gives us the assurance that God always wins. God always wins. And because God is going to come back one day, someday, we can persevere on. The thing is, many of us don't do this nowadays, but can you try your best to journal God's answers to your prayers? We've been praying every night as a church. Every night, 10 o'clock, uh, Elder Ng Chao will send us those prayer things. Many of us don't do this, and I don't do it as well, but I think it's worthwhile to see how God answers some of those prayers that we've asked. Usually those are health concerns and quite a number of us are down with COVID even right now. But God sends His healing, His protection. Do we see a pattern there? Can we trace His plans? Then, of, of course, we need to seek out a community, a community to discern together of God's will with us. Sometimes we cannot see and cannot trace God's plan for us, right? And so therefore, we begin to doubt God. God, are you even there? Like Zion, you know? Do you even care? And this is when we need our brothers and sisters to remind us, to even rebuke us if need be. See that God has always been faithful. We are the ones who have never been faithful. So when we are failing and when we are falling, how can we believe in God, this sovereign God, trust in His promises? trace his plans but what else what else can we do in order to stop our struggles and to start trusting god and this is when we turn to our very final portion which is a huge portion verses 28 of chapter 46 all the way to the end of chapter 47 verse 31 let me read for you just a short portion of it here 
And he says here in verse 31 of chapter 46, he says, Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. Verse 32, and the men are shepherds for they have been keepers of livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servant have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptian. Now, we, the third thing we need to do, not only just do we need to trace his plans, not only do we need to trust his promises, the thing that we need to do really is to heed his word, obey his word. Why do I say that from this portion of scripture here? Let me give you very briefly what's the happening, right? We know that Jacob finally met his son. He went down to Goshen. He sent Judah ahead of, of time, signifying that his trust is not on Judah, not on his firstborn, Reuben. And, and guess what? They met up, they wept, they, they hugged each other. But more importantly, they didn't just hug each other. They heeded his words. Why do I say that? And why is this thing even important? And how does it help us? In our struggles why is heeding god's word helping us in our struggles now this is when we need to understand a little bit about shepherds in the context of the egyptian culture in fact indeed in genesis 47 if you were to go to the next chapter pharaoh exactly asked the same thing that what joseph said that he will say pharaoh said to his brothers what is your occupation and he said to pharaoh your servants are shepherds as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, verse 4, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants. Flocks for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now, please, let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. To understand why it's important for Joseph's brothers to heed his word, we need to know that shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians, as what we see in verse 34 of chapter 46. In fact, if you remember even way back to chapter 43, the Egyptians refused to eat when, when Joseph was pre presenting those meals for his brothers. The Egyptians refused to eat with them because why? Even the food fellowship that they have is an abomination to them, the exact same word. Egyptians could never eat with the Hebrews. Now, there are, there are several reasons why, and these are all speculative, by the way. Perhaps the Egyptians were already moving from a shepherd base to a, what we call an agricultural base uh, dynasty. It depends on who is the pharaoh at the time. This is probably in the mid Middle Kingdom time. Now, this is not Tolkien's Middle Kingdom, all right? This is the Egyptian Middle Kingdom time. And Ramesses, uh, first, second, and third, hasn't come up into power yet. I won't go into those great details. If you want, you can talk to me or even Badu Wenping, and we can share with you a little bit more about this. But it was true that they are moving away into a uh, an agricultural dynasty where sheep or, or flocks and all that that they have are not meant for meat. They're primarily meant for milk and milk for them to bathe, actually, and for drinking as well, and primarily meant for their wool or even the skin, the leather. Whereas, imagine for a while, these people, these Hebrews come, they rear sheep and all these cattle because of meat. It's akin to what happened to me when I was in Indonesia, especially in central Indonesia, with a lot of my Muslim friends. And when we eat, when we eat together, I, I must make sure that for about a few days before that, I don't eat any pork. Because some of them can tell me I can smell pork. 
in you. Seriously, they can. You know, it's the satay you eat, right? <laughs> the the to tong, they, no, no, the, the bakute, they, no, no. But seriously, it, it is not kosher in a sense for the Hebrews. And so, for, for these people, it's halal. It's, it's cannot. It's non-halal for them. And so, because of that, maybe the Egyptians didn't want these people to come to them. And the Hebrews themselves, these people, can you imagine the brothers or even the family of, of uh, Joseph? If they didn't heed Joseph's words, what would happen to them? There may be disaster, right? Because they are what? They're shepherds. And this potentially created a lot of problems for them. Just think about that. If they didn't heed his words, what will happen to their assimilation to the Egyptian culture? What will happen to that syncretism that may happen to them if they were to mix around? What happens about the competition that they may face to one another? Now, if you, if you don't believe that there's competition, in fact, chapter 47 reminds us of how dire the situation is. This is the second year of the famine. There's still five more years to come, you know. And already the people were desperate. Uh, Chapter 47, verses 13 tells us, Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. We know that this is severe. And yet, if you were to drop down to the, towards the end of chapter 47, guess what? We read something really amazing. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, the most fertile land, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147. And in between that, we know what happened, right? The Egyptians came to, uh, uh, in fact, Joseph and begged for mercy and sold their cattle. And guess what? The cattle, if Joseph, you're Joseph, what would you do? I gave it to my brothers. And then he released the grain for them. And so this is what happened. And then all of Egypt became slave to Pharaoh. And this is why it is so important to heed God's word. If we choose to do things our way, we will never allow God to protect us. In this narrative, in this story, we can see that God used Joseph to protect his family. And we can see that God used Joseph to preserve this entire nation. And from this nation came our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So therefore, we need to heed God's word, which is why they prospered, they were protected, and they enjoyed peace. And they were even separated from the Egyptians living in the land of Goshen. And amidst the struggles, God used them, used Joseph especially to save them. Likewise, when we are struggling, when we are wrestling with, with the problems of life, we need to heed God's word. This requires us to first and foremost to trust in all of His promises and we need to trace His plans. Then we heed His words. So we need to stop struggling. Stop struggling by trusting in His promises, tracing His plans, and heeding His word. Now, as I have mentioned to you previously before, many of us still struggle. God never promised to remove us from our problems, you know. But, just as what I've said before, Joseph is the foreshadow of Jesus, right? Even in this story itself, we know that Joseph was an advocate for his family as he has advocated to Pharaoh. Now, Jesus is now our advocate. If you read 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says here, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Joseph had the wisdom of God. 
Scripture tells us Jesus is the wisdom from God. Let me read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And it says here, And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And redemption. We also know that Joseph saved his family from the famine. Jesus didn't just want to save us from our struggles. Jesus wants to save us from our sins. Jesus said to the crowd, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. So in the midst of our struggles, remember, God never promised to deliver us from our problems, but He promised to deliver us in our problems. As you see Jacob and his life, as you meditate on what his life, his examples has given to us, Jacob had to learn hard, hard lessons. Some of us need to learn hard lessons. Remember way back in Genesis 28, way back in Genesis 28, when God tells him to worship him and build an altar and things like that and promise to bless him and all that, what did Jacob said to God, this is what Jacob said to God in Genesis 28, 22 to 23. Then Jacob made a vow saying, he made a vow to God, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread and to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Verse 22, And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, and, all, and of all that you, have, you give me, I will give you a full tenth to you, your tithe to God. This is Jacob in the past. Now, Jacob today, in this passage, I think has changed a lot since then, right? See? As he trust in God's promises, to the obedience, step of obedience and faith to go into Goshen, to Egypt. God honored that. As he traced God's plans for his life, as he takes his long, almost a month's journey down to Goshen from Shechem, he saw that God is with him. And as he heeded God's word, God blessed him and made him fruitful and made his name great. So great that he could even, if you read chapter 47, he could even bless and give a blessing to Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth at that time. So, when we are struggling, what would you do? Jacob ended in chapter 47, a complete surrender to God. This usurper, this grabber, this wrestler finally found peace and rest. Will you surrender to God? Stop struggling and start trusting God. Let us pray. Father God, we confess to you right now that we struggle a lot. We struggle because primarily we are sinful because we have done things that perhaps displeases you and breaks your heart. Yet you have engraved us in the palm of your hands. You have given us the ultimate proof of your love for us by giving us your only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Father God. And because of what Jesus has done, we can therefore now trust in your promises. We can now trace your plan for us and we can ultimately heed your word as we obey Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us, Father God, to stop struggling and start trusting in you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.